guys, welcome to the first real episode of Almost Jewish Talks. So after the really mini interview with Mili Avital, today is really the kickoff episode of this series that I'm doing out of passion with the main aim to shift the stereotypes about Israel and the Jewish people. So I was thinking who should be my first guest and I thought that the most honest way to start this whole interview line is to invite somebody who changed my life in so many levels but when it comes to Israel it's really thanks to him that I am where I am today. So yes we're gonna have a very intimate interview today with my boyfriend, with my best friend, with the rock in my life who took me to Israel for the first time and shook up everything around me. So yes, uh, Doram, thank you very much for doing this for me and letting me put you in the spotlight today. Yes, I appreciate it very much. <laughs> I bet, but you know, it's, it's, it's really the best way, I think, to go back to the journey. And I felt it's, it's the most honest and authentic way to tell my story and start this whole journey with the person that actually puts me on this journey. So you made me from an Eastern European non-Jew and almost Jewish pro-Israel advocate. So it's all because of you. So how do you feel about me doing this interview with you? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a very um, passionate um, Israeli. So the fact that we are talking about my heritage in my country makes me proud so for sure and the fact that i love you so it makes me like this, this is the best thing i could do okay so how do you feel uh, about me pulling out israeli flag wherever we go in the middle of texas and chicago and brussels well um embarrassed um as as part of what we grew up on, we were never uh, taught to uh, sh to show our, our Israeli side in such a in su such a way. Uh, it was always so. It's not something that we are ashamed of, but but we were taught to to beware and to be conscious of. Uh, people that uh, are likely not to side with Israel or or that might even go beyond that. So uh, uh, to publicly go with the flag is something which which we would do if we would go to a to a match like like to a major event, but not just like that walking the streets. So from one hand, I was extremely um, embarrassed. I was worried, so if if something should happen, because it might. Mm -hmm. And with all that, I was also proud, mm -hmm. because I am proud of it, and I am proud of you. So all those feelings were mixed into a very nice salad. So is really embarrassment a good word, or or you are just like like all the friends are telling us, you know, that I'm just simply crazy of doing that. Because as you said, out of fear, out of concern. So it might not be embarrassment, I think. It is rather that you guys are trying to hide something that is is told to you to be hidden. Yeah, I mean, um, it is definitely that. It's also embarrassed in the sense that I'm being put on the spotlight uh, in such a way. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so if... If if there were an event that everybody would come with their flag, I would probably feel better. Mm -hmm. But because we are we are we are doing it without, so there is kind of a hidden cause mm -hmm. behind it. Uh, so it so it makes you feel conscious or, mm -hmm. or, or or more conscious about it. So that makes you embarrassed in that sense. That like, ooh, mm -hmm. look look what we're doing here. Uh, um, in front of all of those people. So, so that's the part of it. Um, and then there is the part of the worry and there is the part of the pride. So they're all mixing mm -hmm. together into this nice um, mixture of feelings, which are generally positive because, we, because 
you do feel that 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 what you're doing is something special yeah i mean you know the kind of hidden agenda behind that and i don't know when i do that i feel just so proud and the only thing is like i get from my friends you know from hungary like oh why don't you go with the hungarian flag why is it israel that you put on your back and things like that but this is my things that i need to put up with but i know that i would I feel very proud when I pull out the Israeli flag and I, f I would feel the same proud or pride when I, I do the Hungarian flag, you know? So for me, it's like, if my values are with the flag, then I'm just proud and I don't even think. That's why I'm always beside you when I do that, so you can protect me. So that's another thing. But let's go back in time a little bit. So we're gonna go a little bit into your family because I was so astonished by your whole grow up growing up you know you were born in the uk and then a little time in brussels and then to israel and then back to belgium so can you tell us a little bit about that like about your upbringing well um yes as you said i was born in london uh, didn't stay there long um, but most of my child was in belgium um, and uh, being a kid of a diplomat, uh, we were in a school which was, which was an Israeli school. Mm -hmm. So I was completely isolated from the general public in that sense that I didn't feel that I was in a non-Jewish surrounding. Mm -hmm. uh, so growing up, the only thing that looking back into those years that the school bus had a police car behind it. But when I grew up, I didn't think about it. I thought that it was completely normal that all the school buses have it. And, and I didn't think about it. So only afterwards, I realized in what context mm -hmm. uh, it was there to prevent any terror attacks or something of that sort. Uh, and we were completely oblivious because we didn't talk about it. So it was not spoken that, look, there is, there is a danger. It was just we were in this bubble uh, um, and and um, I think that only years afterwards I realized what was actually going on mm -hmm. and so when you moved to Israel you were how old were you um, nine and a half okay so what happened then so you grew up in a bubble in a Jewish environment but that's still not like being in Israel so how did you feel when you were taken out of that and put in the hardcore Israeli lifestyle? Yes, I mean, that was a total culture shock. <laughs> uh, I, we did uh, speak basic Hebrew at home, but our whole life was French. So we, so even between me and my siblings, we spoke French. So playing, we spoke French. Going, going to school, we spoke French. Mm -hmm. So everything was in French. And when I came back to Israel, I did not read or write Hebrew. Ah. And, and that was a complete shock. So every class, I, I, I was guessing what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was uh, one of the easiest parts. The real challenge was the culture. Uh, um, this, the European culture, which is kind of... Um, more free and it's 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 okay to finish last and you don't have to push for what you want does not exist in israel uh, uh it, it basically everything was completely flipped you have the culture of the strongest survive rega, rega. so you were introduced to the flyer that you are either a flyer or not yes but 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 like in a in a in a higher Mm -hmm. kind of level so it was not just whether you will come out a fire or not it was you're not going to drink water between classes if you're not going to push and make sure that you drink water mm -hmm. so this this thing that for the few first few weeks i was waiting in line and everybody was cutting me off and i just couldn't drink and i was like what what is going on here mm -hmm. uh, uh and and you don't you need to know that you don't necessarily need to be the strongest but you need to have the mentality that you need to be mm -hmm. 
Because if you don't have that, then for sure you're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, but this with the contrast of the brotherhood, which is very very strong uh, in um, the culture. So the so the friendships are not just friends. It it it's it very very fast it grows to be brotherhood um, and and um, and that is one of the contrasts that from one hand you have to fight for what is yours but on the other hand you have this kind of brotherhood that 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 people will become your brothers in two seconds totally and like. That is good that you mentioned because remember the first time you took me to Israel and then we were in Jerusalem and I only knew like three cursing words in Hebrew. And then there was this parking place you told me to hold and there comes this woman and I start fighting in Hebrew and you know I felt like oh I'm at home I can fight and things. But I knew that at the same time that woman would host me for a Shabbat dinner if I don't have a place to go to. And I okay. think that was really one of the trigger points for me the, during our first time in Israel that, oh, wow, that is something interesting going on here. That we can fight and, yeah, fight for, you know, survival. And then we just become friends also. So that is incredible. And before we go more into your family things, like, talk about more of friendship. Because I think this is something that as an outsider, I envy so much. Like... When I met your friends, especially now talking about, for example, Moshe, there is a friend of yours who are, you are in contact since the army. And no matter the distance, no matter the different lifestyles and life passes, it is brotherhood. Absolutely. Uh, it's, 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 there, are, there are two coins to the same thing, uh, which is the trigger, which is the root cause of it. The coin is this sentiment that we in Israel have, which is the us against them thing. So you have on the flip side of it, you have this brotherhood, which, which the bondings is, mm -hmm. are, 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 are always strong or, or they get stronger because of this context. And you have the other side, which is always uh, uh, this us against them, even when it's not needed, mm -hmm. uh, is 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 very much in the culture. Oh, they they want to take from us. Oh, they want to hurt us. Oh, they mm -hmm. they don't have our best interest. Uh, uh, but the good side of it is this brotherhood, which you get uh, um, from the culture, but also from this army culture because everybody has to go to the army, so they teach you. So they put it into your uh, core core values, uh, and that's something which is basically amplifies everywhere that you go. So you still live in Brussels now. So you went back to Belgium, and it's been like ten, twelve years. So how back then you said as a child you didn't feel anything weird being a Jew in Belgium. Did it change over the years now as an adult living there, knowing that you are Jewish and you are living in a city? where we know that there are many, you know, immigrants from all over. And let's, let's say uh, there are so many Arabs out there. So how do you feel about it? Well, first of all, uh, you're absolutely right. There's, there's, there's a clear bias um, against Israel and the whole, you know, the Palestinian issue. Uh, uh, it's clearly not balanced. Mm -hmm. So if you follow... The UN, uh, uh, it's it's almost on the same kind of a level with the EU. So, so Western Europe is is, is very much biased uh, mm. on on that issue. Um, to, to amplify that, if you live in Brussels, which I would not say half, but almost half of the population is Muslim, uh, in the cap of Europe so uh, you never know who you're gonna fall to whether you go to get your uh, driving license or whether you want to register for something you never know who you're gonna fall on uh, and and 
after a couple of weird experiences, I learned that it is better not to say that I am Israeli, mm-hmm. uh, just to save the hassle of of those weird looks mm-hmm. and 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 those extra problems that you might face. Uh, so, uh, and and yes, also uh, simply by the fact that you walk the streets and and as and as I said. There is a, a a huge Muslim population in the city, so right. you 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 should not um, attract attention to yourself by saying that you are from Israel because again you don't know who you're gonna fall on. Yes, and you know oh, we went through a lot of things, right? Like in Brussels, going to the commune, and you remember how upset I was always that you. Know, you lied about who you were, like you said, okay, you are Brit, when I, when it's like a simple lie. And at the first time when we just started to date, I was like, why are you lying? It's like, why don't you say that you are Israeli? And then as I understood more, I understood that you are kind of protecting me when we are going there and you're protecting the whole, you know, us being around because yeah, as you said, you don't know who you fall on. Or like when we went to the Maccabi match and you remember they were asking us to sign the petition against Israel. So like BDS things. And we were like, I'm sorry, but you are knocking on the wrong doors. And it was just so bad that we couldn't even enjoy a match cheering for Israel without having any kind of assault. And we are getting, you know, to the fact that we are an interface couple. So you say that you as a Jew feel like this, but honestly, at the moment, and that is one of the reasons I, I wanted to move away from Belgium because as a Christian, so as a non-Jew also, I felt like, okay, it's really pretty much going under my wing what is going on and I'm not feeling comfortable like establishing a family there. Like the fact that they rebelled against the Christmas tree and we didn't have a Christmas tree after, you know. So all these uh, ambivalent situations in, in Brussels, I don't... I don't know, but yes, we had our share of experience about that. So let's talk a little bit about us as interface couple, because we get that question so many times, how does it work, right? So how do we work, you think? Or why? Um, well, I mean, first of all, I think that we that we share um, core, core values, which are the same. Um, and I think that we are both defining ourselves as spiritual rather than religious, uh, which which is huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I think that that we both really connected uh, to this uh, part. Of both of our of our cultures and our countries being being bullied and pushed around, uh, uh, that 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 made also kind of um, the connection point between us. Um, and I think that also the fact that both of us were very open to other cultures and 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 to do Christmas and to do Hanukkah and 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 to visit. Uh, the very deep heritage of Hungary and the very deep heritage of Israel. So uh, we are both ancient people. You guys are like 1,200 years. Uh, uh, so I mean, there's there is there is a very heavy heritage that we both share. Uh, and 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 I think the connection uh, of that trip that we took for the first time back in Israel uh, was was it so it really had a big impact on both of us Uh, me sharing my country and sharing it and and you you know taking it absorbing it and uh, I think the fact that we are both uh, very open and we have so many points in common Mm -hmm. helps us uh, uh, to grow together uh, beyond all the challenges that we have faced so far. I mean, there's so much to talk about here, you know, starting from what you mentioned, and I love that you said about it. It's uh, the similarities about Israel and Hungary and many people, you know, just 
stuck in history for what happened to the Hungarian Jews and how Hungarians were, you know, involved in the whole Nazi uh, genocide. And I agree with that. It is part of the history we should never forget. On the other hand, if we step outside a little bit, especially today, both of our countries are, are struggling against similar hypocrisy. There is such a thing and such websites as, uh, you know, anti-Hungarian, because we have still a lot of minorities in uh, Romania, Slovakia and Ukraine. So, so many things people don't know about it, but we kind of have the same struggles. And on the other layer, yes, we have a whole journey, how we m learned to live with each other and embrace our differences, both in culture, languages, you know, and then religion, even though, as I said, we are not uh, like religious person in a very orthodox sense. But here is a question because so many emails that are sent to me are saying that I should convert, you know, or the fact that we are interface, it's not really beneficial for Judaism per se, or I might not feel good in Israel if I go there. So how do you put up with this that maybe some of your brothers, you know, so some other Jews would disagree with what you are doing and they say that, oh, you're actually an embarrassment for, for Judaism? I, I mean, uh, I don't know what other people might say, but my friends and my family uh, all feel the same as I, which is uh, we would rather that a person would be a human being than he would be Jewish or not Jewish or whatnot. So from my perspective, I don't care. It's not that what matters to me what does matter to me is that the person that i am with is a human being is a loving person that loves me that i love her and that we share the same values this is this is what really matters mm -hmm. uh and uh to be totally honest from all the friends that i have nobody's even raised that topic with me in in private sessions mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, and and i do have siblings which are religious uh and and so it is it is very clear that this is not an issue yeah i mean i i honestly hope it's never gonna be an issue and then you know let's um your mother passed away when you were very young so you know that the reason i'm saying it because so many people say okay only the ima is going to be the problem only the ima is going to... so let's talk a little bit about your mother because i think that is just like one of the most amazing stories I heard about how a family can work. So your mother was not a religious person, but a very pro-Israel and a very spiritual person. And then when she remarried, you have Nahal siblings, as you said, who are very Orthodox Jews. So you had a household of an absolutely non-Jewish part and a very religious Jewish part, and it worked. How did it affect you? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, it taught me how to be tolerant and it taught me how to, you know, accept the other and the different. Uh, but it was done in a very um, uh, light mm -hmm. manner. So it was never forced on us. Uh, we We were actually asked to allow it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was the other way around. Uh, and um, but but we were given our freedom in our own spaces. So in our rooms to do whatever we wanted and even beyond it. Um, but the public, you know, spaces which were defined beforehand, we shared them. And so like the living room, we would not put TV there, but 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 we would mm -hmm. but we would watch TV in our rooms, and the kitchen was completely separated between meat and milk, mm -hmm. uh, with different dishes and and everything was was like uh, different ovens, different sinks, everything. So we so we had to do kind of a whole renovation of the kitchen to make it uh, mm -hmm. that way, and um, it soon became that rather than going to watch a movie 
Friday nights, we would all stay in the living room and be together. And, 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 and that's the beauty of it. So when, when it's not forced, whenever you, 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 you take care of the reason why the Sabbath was even created was to rest and to be with your family. Mm -hmm. So if you apply that rather than, than give rules and, and you should not uh, put the light and don't do this and don't do that. So when you make people do the things out of the freedom of their choice, that's when things become beautiful. And that's why it was a success in spite of the uh, ages like teenagers, uh, differences, religion, uh, uh, and, and it, it was clearly a very explosive atmosphere, which not at all uh -huh. because of the way that it was done. Yeah, I think that's incredible. And when I met your uh, half siblings the first time, I mean, you know, I was so scared, really scared because I was like, how do I dress for a Shabbat dinner? So they were really, really the first, like, very observant, you know, Shabbat table that they offered for me. And I just really love being around them. So whenever we go to them and here is a shout out to your siblings, because they really never made me feel as an outsider, even though knowing, you know, some kind of other religious people around me who always say that oh, I should convert. So they never even tried to indicate anything like that. So, yeah, okay, let's talk about a little bit about your work. So just quickly say what you're doing and what is your business about. I am... Um, not in the, the diamond chief. business. Sorry? <laughs> you are not in the diamond business. I'm not in the diamond business. I'm a, I'm a manager. I'm an owner of, the, of a business, which is a uh, fitting the Jewish stereotype of being a consultant or, or a lawyer or an advisor. So that's what we do. We are a consultant on EU regulations. Um, and um, what I do most of the day is give advice uh, to people that need and wish to launch a, their own you know, product to the EU market. The reason I'm asking because we talked about the unpleasantness of being in Belgium at the moment but you tour a lot in the US. So as a business person, you know, it always comes up as an ice breaking talk where you are from, blah, blah, blah. So do you lie also there in the US? Do you say that you are Brit? I think, I mean, I don't see it as a lie. I just see it as a half truth. Okay. Uh, and I would even tell it to Eskimos uh, because it's so much in me. So it's not about the place that I am. Uh, it's about the habit. Mm -hmm. So, so it's just the habit, uh, that listen, it's safer to say that I am British mm -hmm. than to say that I am Israeli because it might even be that this Eskimo is a Muslim. Who knows? Even so then, it's, it shouldn't be so the way that my mind. But you see, we talk so much about it that even then, just because he's a Muslim, it's not, you know, an automatic reaction that you should be afraid, but I understand, I'm like, I understand more and more because since I'm with you, I feel anti-Semitism on my skin. I mean, you know how many friends I lost just because I'm with you. I blame you, right? But really, it just, it's just amazing. And, and even today, I feel like, oh, how many, let's say that trick, what we do. You remember when we like meet strangers and we start talking and we get like five seconds to know whether they're going to talk with us after they know that you are Israeli? Yes. I mean, that is yes, just that. something that we mastered. Like, we really know whether we can be friends with them or not, or, you know. That was like something that I showed you first. So, so I said, listen, I'm going to tell them that I am from Israel. See, see how their face changes. See how their facial expressions right. come up. And, and, and we indeed, we were able to master it. And in two seconds, we yeah. know already, okay. With these people, we will not be talking again. <laughs> uh, it just freaks me out sometimes because it's it's like, you know, we are nice people and to make friendships sometimes it's just so much harder just because you are Israeli, you're putting us in this situation, you know. But yeah, so in the US, I do think that you feel better, no? So like many times you actually admit where you are from and you have 
brothers here, kind of, you know, like big community brothers. So it's 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 easier than in, in Western Europe, no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, definitely if you go uh, to New York, where you are, which is actually very helpful to be Jewish, uh, 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 or in LA, right? Uh, so, so these are places that uh, that it that I that I always felt comfortable, and I was never uh, feeling the same way. So yes, it is it is definitely mm -hmm. easier in those places. Uh, but just like I said, my first reaction, my habit mm -hmm. is if I don't see on a business card. Uh, a Jewish name like Berkowitz or something like that. My first, uh -huh. Uh -huh. my first answer is that I am kind of neutral. Right. And then if I would, if I would get to know the person, I might open up. Yes. Okay, but now you made me think, and I, I wasn't sure I'm gonna raise it up or not. But you remember last time? I think it was somewhere. Where were we? In San Diego, perhaps. And you met this uh, couple of like a leader or CEO of the companies and they said that they are from Palestine, right? And I'm like yeah. thinking, what a strength. And he was even saying something bad or like, you know, he had an attitude. So I was like imagining you saying, hi, and I'm from Israel, let's do business together. Because you eventually said that, you know, they were like not super nice. Again, it's like, not, let's not, let's not uh, generalize, but I think it takes such a strength you know, to, to sit in front of people who you know that if they get to know who you are, they're just going to close out business and hate you or what's, what's not, you know? I mean, uh, yes. Uh, um, but the funny thing is that the best experiences that I had in business were in Arab, were with Arab. Uh, so okay. uh, um, I have met wonderful Egyptians and wonderful Syrians mm -hmm. and wonderful Iranians and uh, uh, Lebanese. So I mean, I mean that that uh, when I opened up and I said, "Listen, I am Israeli," and so forth, there was not even like a a. So actually, they were much more welcoming than the Belgians or the French right. or whatever that I've that I've met. Um, but yes, I also had the worst experiences. Mm -hmm. So you never know who you from. So yeah. this is, this is the thing. So yes, uh, when I had to deal with those gentlemen, uh, um, I knew that if I would raise it, that would totally ruin the whole, the whole talk. So, yeah. so I had to help myself. Okay, let's let's go back now to Europe and to Eastern Europe, to Hungary, and I'm gonna raise the topic because first of all, I'm Hungary, and second of all, you know we read all kind of media, and Hungary still comes across as a country with high anti-Semitism, where it's growing, and all these issues, and your big, which is like I can't emphasize enough how tiny little part is that with some idiots, right-wing people. So you come to Hungary quite often, right? And there we are very open about who you are. Did you ever have a bad experience, a look, or anything that would make you feel uncomfortable? Never, never. I mean, I, 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 it might be that I was lucky or that the people that we met really love you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I have never felt anything even remotely close to uh comments mm -hmm. or or any kind of a facial expressions or anything of the sort don't so i only got uh, care love you know attention acceptance mm -hmm. uh, so i think that that there is kind of a misconception of Hungary 70 or 80 or, or 100 years ago versus today. 
and and uh, people that have this opinion have not either been there or or actually talked to people there. It's just like people would say, "Oh, the Germans are all bad." It's not true, mm-hmm. uh, or, or or that the Germans are still Nazis. That's not true. That's that that is absolutely nonsense. Mm-hmm. Just like people say. Hungary is uh, anti-Semite. It's nonsense. It it was at a certain point in history, just like almost any other country in in the in the EU, like Spain, like like France, like UK, like Russia, like everywhere else. There was a period that there was anti-Semitism uh, in Hungary in a very open way, but I think that 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 era is long gone. Yes, and we often talk about it also, right, that how much it shifted to Western Europe today. And still people like to say, oh, the EU, as if the EU would be a country. Or like, you know, saying that the whole EU is like that. And it is not true, and this is something that I think we both feel in our skin. You know, whether like we are in Brussels, we feel insecure or unsafe rather, you know, in, in our identity and how much we can actually put it out there. Whereas in Eastern Europe, we feel safer at the moment, but that is a whole political discussion. So what do you think is the biggest misconception about Jews and Israel in general? Well, aside from the typical ones that we are everywhere and we are rich and that we want to take over the world, um, I think uh, today, the misconception is that people think that Israel is the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that if people go there and see that Arabs in Israel enjoy the highest quality of life in the Middle East, they have the highest level of education, they have the highest levels of rights for women or for gay or for whatever, People have freedoms that they could only dream of in any other Arab, Arab country. And, and, and still, they think that Israel is the problem. Mm-hmm. So this is the biggest misconception of the media, of, 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 of whatever uh, forces out there that uh, aim to show it this way mm-hmm. for their own benefits or for their own interests. But this is absolutely not true. Okay. So we established the fact that you are not really coming from a strong religious family and you have a very international background in that sense that you were both European, both Israeli, so in a diaspora and then in Israel. So what does being Jewish mean to you today? Well, it means... First of all, for me, I am extremely proud to be Jewish. Um, it means to me to be part of a of an amazing heritage, um, and and to be part of a people that, in many ways, shape the world mm-hmm. we know today, from the stories of the Bible that that everybody follows to the theories of relativity of, of Einstein. So. And all the things which are in between, there there was there was a Jew mm. at at every point, but not to conquer other countries and not to force the Jewish faith on other people and not to make uh, um, uh, uh, people uh, to cut their hands because they made a sin and all those things, mm-hmm. but but to contribute to the better of the world. So being being a, a, a Jew and being an Israeli, this is what I believe in that, that we have to do, that we have to find ways to better the world. And 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 we see evidence to it all over uh time and history. Mm. So I am extremely proud to be part of it. Wow, I mean I could talk with you for hours, but that's why you are my boyfriend, so that I have the chance to do that always. <laughs> but thank you so much for doing this for me. And 
yes, it was a really weird situation for me interviewing my own boyfriend, but I think it was really interesting also for us sometimes to revisit, you know, how we started and how we think. And to sum it up, I do think that the reason we work so well is because of the values. So, you know, it's it's really what is the core in a relationship, to believe in the same things. We still have some issues to figure out, like where do you want your kids to grow up? Uh-huh. Yalla, Efo, where? Listen, I mean, uh, I think that everybody would like for their children the best um, that they can possibly give. And in many ways, um, I think that that place is Israel. I mean, it gave me so much. Mm -hmm. It gave me uh, weather. It gave me a warmth. It gave me brotherhood. It gave yeah. me experiences. It made me a boy. It made me a man. Uh, uh, it, it, it made me realize uh, uh, that things are different and things should not be taken for granted. I mean, I I truly had, um, and I'm and I'm very thankful to my parents that they were able to give me this kind of an international childhood, mm -hmm. uh, um, which which ended up in Israel, allowing me to grow up as an Israeli roots. man. I have roots. Uh, and have roots, um, and and I often, when I was growing up, when I was in my twenties, I was comparing myself to other guys mm -hmm. my age in mm -hmm. in you know other countries, and I felt that I was like ten years older than them right. in my perspective, yeah. uh, uh, and 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 I was very very grateful for it. So definitely, I think that. Uh, if I could choose, I would love my my kids to have the same heritage. Mm -hmm. So to be this kind of a Israeli, you know, kind of a combina guys that they can make things happen right. and they can go into the room and dominate it uh, uh, because they come. You know, the in the stuff. Hungarian blood, we also have this, so we can, you know, talk about it. <laughs> no, yes, I mean. <laughs> I have nothing against, you know, that how much I love Israel, but yes, it just to shed a little bit of light about, you know, the challenges that as an interface couple we are facing. And yeah, we have many on the list, but I think the good still outgrows the, the challenges. So here we are. And thank you so much for being with me today. So this was the first episode of Talks with an Almost Jewish. And during the next couple of weeks, I will invite guests from all walks of life like really people are, who are having any established names people who are just starting out in their niche stay home moms who are like my biggest heroes in israel i mean these women are like incredible so i gonna invite so many guests here because i want to you know really talk with israelis and jews and bring it to an audience who perhaps people who were like my old self you know not knowing anything about israel or knowing very little having a stereotypical idea or just having the narrative that the media is telling us so i thought that you know beside a coffee we can bring israel and the jewish people closer to other communities and this is the aim here and my name is virag the founder of almost jewish Thank you, Motek, Todaraba, and thank you everyone for watching us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.